Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining our live webinar on hematological changes and coagulopathy in COVID-19. My name is Dr. Vineet Nair, and I will be a moderator for today's event. Today's webinar is brought to you by Suburban Diagnostics in conjunction with Hariba Medical. I would like to remind everyone that today's webinar is interactive, and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To submit a question, simply type the question into the chat box on your right and click send. At the end of the presentation, we will be having a Q&A session and we will answer as many questions as time allows. If during the presentation you have any trouble hearing or seeing the presentation, please use the chat box to let us know that you're experiencing a problem. I would now like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Amardas Gupta, preeminent hematopathologist and director of medical services at Suburban Diagnostics. Over the past four decades, he has had a storied career in hematopathology at institutions like the Postgraduate Institute for Medical Education and Research in Chandigarh, Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai, the University of Washington, Seattle, Hammersmith Hospital, London, Hinduja Hospital, Mumbai, and SRL Diagnostics, Mumbai. A fellow of the International Union Against Cancer and of the Indian Society of Hematology and Blood Transfusion, he has over 125 published scientific papers in national and international journals and was also responsible for setting up India's first hybridoma laboratory and India's first cytometry laboratory way back in 1995. Without further ado, let me hand over the reins of this webinar to Dr. Das Gupta. Over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, Vineet, uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be able to speak uh, with my uh, medical colleagues and scientific colleagues across uh, this part of the country. And uh, I would uh, start with uh, uh, by conveying uh, my greetings to all of you on Maharashtra Day, and uh, which also happens to be uh, World Labor Day. And uh, as we all know, the world is going through a crisis situation uh, due to coronavirus uh, pandemic. And uh, by now, many of you must have been exposed to uh, a number of uh, CMEs and uh, webinars on this subject. So while deciding about the topic of today's presentation, uh, we brainstormed internally and uh, decided to talk about or uh, share with you information on uh, a, a topic which uh, to the best of my knowledge has not been uh, widely covered in the recent uh, uh, academic activities that I referred to just now. Uh, so what I'm going to do over the next uh, 40, 45 minutes is to share with you the hematological changes and, uh, the, and insights into the coagulopathy in COVID-19 infection. So as we know, uh, this entire uh, problem started as a cluster of unexplained pneumonia cases uh, in uh, People's Republic of China, uh, specifically in Wuhan. And this was first reported, although the cases were being seen over the last uh, few uh, months. Uh, first time in December 2019. And it is the WHO which gave the terminology uh, coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19 uh, 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 after it was realized that uh, the uh, epidemic then uh, restricted, of course, to China was due to a novel coronavirus infection and was named as a severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus 2 or SARS-CoV-2. And till date, as we are aware, more than 3.2 million people around the world have been infect infected. And this uh, pandemic has already claimed uh, more than 0.2 million lives, emphasizing the magnitude of the problem posed to the human civilization by this virus. This slide uh, highlights the role of uh, laboratory medicine or diagnostic uh, labs in uh, the management of uh, coronavirus or COVID-19 infection. Uh, starting with confirmation uh, of diagnosis with the help of uh, what is now widely uh, 
practiced uh, rt pcr uh, to the uh, stage of epidemiological survey in people who have recovered from the disease interspersed uh, by uh, the various uh, ivd tests or uh, lab tests uh, that have been used or are being used uh, for staging prognostication and therapeutic monitoring of these cases uh, my talk today will be more uh, focused on this uh, middle part which is uh, the staging prognostication and therapeutic monitoring of uh, these cases and with specific uh, reference to hematological changes and uh, coagulation abnormalities in these patients so i will uh, uh, highlight these three aspects of the disease uh, namely the abnormalities of cellular and coagulation pathways in pathogenesis of uh, COVID-19 infection, changes that we observe in blood cells, including those in the lymphocytes and the immune regulatory cells, and finally coagulopathy and associated changes in the coagulation parameters. But before we get into the uh, you know specific or uh, hardcore data, uh, I thought of sharing this slide with you and the next one, uh, which I think is uh, very important for understanding what I'm going to talk to you over the next uh, uh, few minutes. Uh, and uh, therefore, this is uh, uh, has this slide has a central role in understanding the various changes that happen in the hemopoietic system, as well as the coagulation pathways uh, in this disease. Now, as you can see here, on the left hand side, uh, as the virus uh, enters the respiratory system, uh, it has a predilection for the uh, lining epithelial cells of the uh, respiratory system or respiratory airway and infects these cells uh, to the point of the alveolar space. And as a result of uh, cell uh, uh, death and destruction, uh, a set of uh, events are uh, brought into action uh, which uh, are essentially uh, intense inflammatory uh, process and at the center of the, all this of this process is uh, what we call as monocytes or macrophages which are abundantly present in the respiratory system so what these uh, cells do that is the macrophages do is once they get activated, they liberate a host of uh, cytokines and mediators. And uh, these cytokines and mediators have on one side influence on the uh, hemopoietic cells, uh, as well as uh, on the uh, coagulation cascade as we are uh, aware of. Uh, so as a result of this um, uh, event, or release of cytokines by the uh, monocyte or the macrophages, uh, the cells such as neutrophils and lymphocytes uh, get drawn into the inflammatory process. And they move from, uh, say for example, the neutrophils move from the marginal pool into the circulation. And during this process of activation of neutrophils, they liberate uh, 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 host of cytokines themselves uh, and also uh, there is stimulation of the bone marrow by these cytokines liberated by the macrophages which in turn recruit cells from the bone marrow so there is on one side uh, production increased production of the uh, granulocytes or neutrophils on the other side uh, due to cell death which is caused by what we call as autophagy uh, neutrophils uh, are getting destroyed so there is a balance which is struck, uh, of course, that fluctuates from time to time, uh, whereby the number of neutrophils in circulation varies depending on which side of the balance the process is tilted. So uh, if you have uh, less destruction and more production, you will get increment in the neutrophil count, while if there is more uh, destruction and less production, then you have uh, lowering of the neutrophil count. Uh, and therefore, this uh, factor is very, very important for us to keep in mind. Uh, 
uh, because uh, there is uh, a calculated value which is called NLR or neutrophil lymphocyte uh, count ratio, which has come up as a good prognostic marker for uh, categorizing patients of COVID-19 infection uh, along with the age of the patient into different prognostic groups and therefore uh, give them different kinds of therapy. In addition to the neutrophil, as you can see on the left side of the uh, slide, uh, the cytokines also have influence on the, uh, particularly the T lymphocytes. And as a result of that, the T lymphocytes themselves secrete a host of uh, what we call as lymphokines. And uh, these cells, uh, these uh, substances, the lymphokines, have their own influence on the various other cells in the immune system. But what is important also to note is that in the process of activation, uh, these cells also uh, undergo cell degeneration and death. So the lymphocyte count in uh, and since lymphocytes cannot be recruited in the circulation uh, at a rapid rate, the lymphocyte count in these patients goes down. And therefore, what we see in these patients is uh, lymphopenia on one side and either uh, normal uh, or slightly decreased or slightly increased neutrophil count. And this is important for us to keep in mind. Please also notice just on top of the neutrophils, uh, we have uh, what is um, written as platelet aggregates. And uh, this again is something which is for us to keep a note of because uh, thrombocytopenia is a very important or cardinal finding in patients of uh, COVID-19 infection. But let's focus now on the right side of the slide, uh, which shows the famous coagulation cascade or uh, coagulation pathway, which uh, leads finally to the production of fibrin or fibrin generation. Now, as you can see here, there are two stages in the coagulation pathway. Uh, in one uh, stage, uh, there is activation of uh, factor nine uh, with the help of activated factor eight. And this, product that is activated factor 8, factor 9 complex is called tinase and that is brought about by phosphatidylserin liberated by the same macrophages which are sitting at the center of uh, the mischief that we are uh, talking about. Uh, in addition to that, tissue factors are also liberated by these macrophages and they have an action uh, on the uh, uh, this uh, factor 10A, factor 5 phospholipid and calcium complex uh, uh, and factor 7A or tissue factor is required for uh, production of this complex, which is called prothrombinase. And as the name would uh, suggest, uh, this is a very strong enzyme which converts uh, prothrombin into thrombin. And uh, thrombin is a very powerful uh, procoagulant protein uh, because it converts fibrinogen into fibrin and subsequently, as you can see, uh, going downwards, uh, formation of uh, thrombus or, uh, or um, clot, uh, in which, of course, red cells are trapped, and you have platelets trapped as well. So all this on one side causes, and that gets deposited on the endothelial surface of the blood vessels. So on one side, it causes, uh, if it is a small blood vessel, occlusion of the blood vessel, uh, on the other side, it uh, leads to several changes in the uh, coagulation parameters. For example, uh, fibrin formation uh, and cross-linking of the fibrin uh, monomers or polymers uh, give rise to uh, thrombin. Uh, and this uh, thrombin, when uh, I'm sorry, the thrombus. So when this thrombus is acted upon by the uh, fibrinolytic pathway, the cross-linked fibrin or fibrin polymers yield what we call as D-dimers. And uh, it is a God-given uh, system that uh, we always have activation of the fibrinolytic pathway whenever there is activation of the clotting pathway. So uh, simultaneously, there is attempt on the part of the body to digest this thrombi uh, and uh, there is production of uh, D-dimer as a result of that. Uh, Digestion of fibrin and fibrinogen gives rise to what we call as FDP, fibrin degradation product or fibrinogen degradation product. So uh, 
the difference in these two products or these two end uh, products uh, would be that D dimer indicates primarily a thrombotic process, while FDP uh, represents an ongoing uh, fibrinolytic process, which is uh, subsequent to the thrombotic process. So I think this we need to keep in mind. And uh, while going through the subsequent slides, uh, this knowledge will come very handy. And when translated into uh, the alveoli, uh, this process of uh, uh, activation of the uh, inflammatory pathways and uh, cellular activation ultimately give rise to a uh, collection of various kinds of uh, proteinaceous material, including fibrin, in the alveolar space uh, or alveolar sac. And some of that, of course, exudes out into the space between the alveolar lining cells and the uh, endothelial cells of the adjacent uh, blood vessels. And because of the uh, effusion of these material into this space, the space increases. And as you can imagine now, that uh, with the uh, a lot of foreign or uh, abnormal substances in the alveolar space, as you can see on the right half of the alveolus, and the uh, gap between the alveolar uh, lining cells and the endothelial cells of the blood vessels, the uh, you know exchange of various gases, which normally happens at this level, gets badly hampered. And as a result of this, as we all are aware now, that uh, respiratory uh, you know, uh, symptoms or respiratory abnormalities uh, uh, as a result of uh, changes, organic changes in the lungs following these uh, microscopic uh, changes that I've just now referred to uh, cause uh, increased uh, morbidity and mortality in these patients. So pneumonia is a cardinal presentation in these pa patients. And you can also see that in the adjoining blood vessels, there are uh, microthrombi. So this is uh, actually a messed up situation, which uh, uh, obviously is a very serious uh, matter and uh, uh, leads to the problem that uh, these patients face. And of course, uh, as I explained in the previous slide, uh, there are changes which happen in the blood and uh, various parts of the uh, body reflecting the basic or the fundamental that I showed in these two slides. So coming to the various uh, laboratory parameters that uh, have been uh, looked at and uh, published as uh, possible or potential prognostic markers because they seem to be correlated with increased incidence of uh, death in these patients. And uh, here in this publication, uh, some of the products were examined and these are listed here. And uh, as you can see, uh, patients who survive uh, versus those who did not survive in this particular series, uh, there were differences in the uh, lymphocyte count, platelet count, LDH, troponin I, prothrombin time, serum ferritin, IL-6, and D-dimer. So out of these, the coagulation parameters and the hematological parameters uh, for our discussion and interest would be lymphocyte count, platelet count, prothrombin time, and D-dimer. And as you can see here, out of these four, uh, at least lymphocyte count, uh, and in other words, lymphocytopenia is closely associated with uh, uh, mortal, increased mortality in these patients as uh, evident from the first set of data in, the, in a vertical uh, column, 76% uh, uh, incidence of uh, lymphocytopenia in these patients uh, versus uh, you know, only 26% in the survivors uh, with a p-value, which is statistically significant value of 0 0.001. The platelet count or thrombocytopenia is another parameter which has been found to be significantly uh, correlated uh, with increased uh, mortality. Uh, prothrombin time in this particular series has not been found to be significantly different in the two groups, but again, uh, there are other reports where uh, people have reported that uh, prothrombin time seems to be correlated or increased prothrombin times rather uh, seems to be correlated with increased mortality. Uh, D-dimer undisputably uh, uh, has been shown to be correlated with poor prognosis or increased mortality. And not only that, in fact, uh, 
uh, this particular study showed that with increasing D dimer level, when you look at the subgroup of these patients with uh, mild elevation to high elevation, uh, the incidence of mortality uh, also increases with increasing level of D dimer. So these are the uh, initial data that were presented uh, in the world literature around uh, earlier this year. And um, uh, Lippi and his colleague Plebani uh, tried to summarize uh, eight uh, Chinese publications which have uh, published these data and try to bring some kind of a semblance uh, or uh, authenticity in the uh, in the, the data that these uh, uh, series uh, have uh, highlighted. And uh, I have just uh, put the incidences in bracket for those where they have actually uh, given a clear cut, uh, you know, uh, range of uh, incidence of these abnormalities. Uh, and here again, I would like you to focus on uh, the second and the third uh, point, which is uh, increased lymphocyte count and decreased lymphocyte, uh, sorry, increased neutrophil count and decreased lymphocyte count. And uh, based on, and this seems to be, as I shared with you in the uh, diagram that I showed you earlier, uh, the ratio between neutrophil count and the lymphocyte count seems to be uh, very important with respect to, uh, or rather, I would say one of the prognostic markers, important prognostic markers uh, for stratifying patients of uh, COVID-19 infection into different uh, levels of management in terms of intensity of management, extending from uh, just uh, observation and isolation to uh, transfer to ICU with intensive uh, respiratory support and uh, other, uh, you know, management, uh, intensive management uh, uh, approaches. So this is the conclusion, which unfortunately, sorry for the uh, part of the slide not being visible here. The NLR, which is the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, uh, is meaningful parameter for prognosis and risk stratification and is helpful to alleviate insufficient medical resources. Uh, the English is a little uh, confusing, but what it is actually trying to say is that using this parameter uh, one and, and the age of the patient, one can stratify these patients into these groups uh, and uh, offer appropriate treatment to these patients depending on the uh, uh, possibility of uh, uh, the uh, severity of the disease and therefore save the resources which are anyway scarce nowadays uh, for people who need them the most uh, compared to those who may not need them. Uh, so this is a very uh, profound statement. I'm not very sure if uh, indeed uh, this fact has been proven in large series, but these are again initial uh, data from China. And in fact, in the world literature today, if you hear the uh, recent reviews, or webinars, uh, there are a lot of question marks asked about uh, some of these parameters that have been uh, suggested by these uh, earlier studies. So I think we'll have to keep uh, looking at these data a little more objectively as we go along. Thrombocytopenia, as I mentioned and I showed in the diagram, um, is a very uh, important component of uh, COVID-19 infection. And this particular uh, publication uh, uh, from China again and Wuhan in particular uh, concluded that thrombocytopenia is common in patients with COVID-19 infection and it is associated again with increased risk of in-hospital mortality. The lower the platelet count is, the higher the mortality becomes. So this is a very important statement that is uh, coming out of this uh, paper. And in fact, subsequent papers and uh, reviews and uh, uh, reviews of uh, various publications have indeed showed that this is a truth. And therefore, this is something which we uh, monitor in these patients. Uh, and one point I would like to uh, mention here is that uh, although we see uh, high incidence of thrombocytopenia in patients who uh, do bad uh, or badly in the uh, in this group of um, patients, the uh, degree of thrombocytopenia in these patients is uh, as reflected 
by the nadir uh, count which of course again i have got some slides to share with you uh, the degree of thrombocytopenia is not uh, that severe as compared to what we see in dic patients as a result of uh, sepsis which is a classic example of dic that uh, we come across in clinical practice so this is a point i would request you to keep in mind so that you understand the subsequent data uh, a little better uh, this uh, slide again is derived from the previous uh, publication that i just now uh, showed you uh, what you can see here these are uh, on the vertical axis the median platelet counts uh, so as shown in the lower graph uh, represented by solid dots uh, the median median means the if you have 100 uh, samples uh, the middle value uh, of uh, the series of values that you will get in terms of platelet counts here uh, is the one which is called median which is like uh, it has uh, equal distribution of cases on both the sides so when you look at that uh, these patients uh, who had higher mortality had a progressively decreasing median platelet count so this is a uh, these are these data are from the groups of patients and not of individual patients so this itself is a very important information that uh, one has to take into account when you compare that uh, with the uh, topmost uh, graph uh, represented by open uh, circles small circles uh, you can see that in most of the people who uh, survived these are the survivors uh, had a platelet count almost above 200 200000 except uh, maybe towards the end of uh, these Uh, you know uh, a prolonged uh, follow up uh, why this has happened the dip uh, i do not know but uh, even uh, here if you see the platelet count median platelet count in this particular uh, time point was more than 150000 which is normal so the point to note here is that all these survivors had a constantly normal platelet count and didn't have thrombocytopenia so that is very important point to keep in mind going ahead uh, the same data uh, has been uh, in a different series though uh, uh, has been projected or presented in a different way uh, so this is a little complex uh, slide so i will uh, uh, draw your attention to uh, because it has three parameters in this uh, particular uh, uh, graph uh, the bars represent the uh, in number of cases uh, so in this case Uh, the the bar is longest, and these are the patients who, and these are all COVID nineteen patients who uh, had hundred uh, fifty to two hundred or beyond rather uh, platelet count per thousand uh, uh, or per cubic millimeter, hundred fifty thousand to uh, and beyond per cubic millimeter, and uh, this uh, in contrast, and they had a mortality. of less than 5% but when you look at the uh, patients who had the highest mortality although the numbers are very small again that brings in the question of comparing equal groups and therefore the statistical significance of these data but uh, on the face of it it seems that uh, patients who had uh, less than 50000 or 50000 uh, per cubic millimeter platelet count had a mortality of above 90% so again and in between you had these intermediate groups so this again proves the point i am trying to drive across that thrombocytopenia and the severity thereof seems to be correlated with uh, increased mortality in these patients and here also the same thing is shown in a different way uh, so you can see here the survivors uh, uh, had the number of thrombocytopenia or percentage was only 10% while in patients who didn't survive the incidence of thrombocytopenia was almost 3% and again the low lowest platelet count in the non survivors reached around 43000 and of course in the survivors it was above the normal range, uh, the lower limit so again this proves the point that in patients of covid-19 infection 
the thrombotic or uh, hypercoagulable state that we are seeing does not cause a severe degree of thrombocytopenia, although thrombocytopenia does occur. And even within uh, a limited range of low platelet counts, there seems to be correlation uh, with the, uh, you know, the lowest count that these patients attain. So this is important for us to also keep in mind. This brings us to uh, the, uh, the central actor or the main actor in the, uh, the entire pathogenesis of uh, uh, COVID-19 infection, and that is the monocytes. And uh, naturally, people wanted to look at uh, the monocytes uh, in a little greater detail. And what one can see morphologically also under the microscope that uh, monocytes in COVID-19 patients have cytoplasmic changes which indicate their activation and these distended vacuo, uh, uh, you know, or the vacuoles actually represent the distended uh, lysosomes which uh, are indicators of increased um, uh, cytokine production by these cells. Uh, and maybe some of you can appreciate that the monocytes do tend to look a little larger than the uh, monocytes in a healthy donor and uh, this is also proven uh, more objectively by uh, the uh, flow cytometry data uh, wherein uh, people have looked at the size of the monocytes and this is actually a control sample and this is a patient of COVID-19 infection as you can see here this monocyte population has uh, which is sitting uh, below the granulocytes has shifted in terms of its size from here to here in the patient population, <clears throat> meaning thereby that these patients, our COVID-19 infection patients, have larger monocytes. And that may be because of the uh, various cytoplasmic inclusions and increased production of various kinds of uh, proteins by these cells. And therefore, they are larger in size. And this is also supported by uh, the graph or the tip, uh, bar diagram here, wherein you, you can see that in patients, the incidence of larger uh, you know, monocytes, as shown here in the gray color, was more uh, than in the controls. So this is just uh, an observation which uh, also points towards the role the monocytes play in this uh, disorder. A uh, very interesting observation of late that has been reported in the world literature in the terminally ill patients of COVID-19 infection is what we call as leukoerythroplastic picture, which means that unlike normal blood smears where you can see the neutrophils and the mature leukocytes, in patients of COVID-19 infection, we start seeing um, NRBCs or nucleated red blood cells and uh, granulocytic precursors, immature granulocytic cells uh, in the circulation. And the reason, and usually in patients who are terminally ill uh, and this possibly reflects the uh, pressure or the you know the stimulus that the bone marrow is being subjected to by the cytokine storm that these patients undergo as the disease progresses uh, and many of these cytokines have influence on the uh, you know cellular production as i mentioned that recruitment of neutrophils from the bone marrow increases in this condition uh, and therefore uh, in that process, a lot of uh, immature precursors of the granulocytic series also tend to come out. And this may also be further added uh, or aided rather by the, uh, you know, hypoxia that these patients uh, have. So all these taken together, and this is, these are very interesting cases that are being now reported in the world literature. And this may be a, a bad sign in these patients as far as their uh, you know, prognosis is concerned. So I thought I'll share this information with you. Uh, in the next three slides, I just wanted to highlight uh, uh, the functional aspects of, uh, you know, the lymphocyte population with respect to their um, ability or their uh, cytokine profile, as we say, or lymphokine profile. And uh, we are aware that, as I refer to also in during, um, describing the slide uh, or the figure, <clears throat> Uh, is that uh, these uh, cells uh, generate a lot of uh, these uh, cytokines normally uh, 
uh, and a, a variety of cytokines actually normally but production or reduction in the production of some of the cytokines uh, can happen in various disease or inflammatory conditions and what we see as you can see here that in the uh, normal T helper cells these are the control cells and these are three dimensional uh, scatter plots of uh, flow cytometry uh, histograms <clears throat> uh, showing uh, and comparing the profile uh, cytokine profile of uh, helper T cells in normal people with those of COVID-19 patients. And as you can see, there's very little difference between the two patterns, indicating that the T helper cells are not much impacted with respect to their cytokine profile or with respect to the kind of cytokines they produce. But when you look at the CD8 positive T lymphocytes, uh, there is a significant difference between the two profiles. Uh, with respect to these, uh, you know, cytokines and uh, granzyme, for example, is a very important enzyme uh, required for direct killing of uh, bacteria and foreign cells, uh, which invade the body. And as you can see here in the COVID-19 infected patients, the uh, secretion or cells secreting granzyme B uh, is reduced compared to the controls. And this may have uh, some uh, pathogenetic uh, correlation or uh, you know in, in impact uh, uh, in the pathogenesis of uh, this disease uh, whether these are uh, cause or effect of the disease that is something which uh, one doesn't know uh, but uh, this is something which we are observing in these patients T lymphocytes so this uh, is something which uh, again um, is uh, there are more groups who are doing uh, studies on the uh, various profiles of these uh, uh, lymphoid cells. So this is just one example of uh, the difference that we observe in the COVID-19 patients uh, lymphoid cell or T lymphoid cell population. And the this diagram actually uh, simplifies all that uh, you know one has seen in the earlier slides. And uh, just to highlight that uh, T lymphocytes in the COVID infected patients uh, have a totally different antigenic profile compared to the controls. And that means that there is something different that is happening in these cells. And this obviously has uh, very uh, in, uh, important implications on the uh, way these cells function in these patients and therefore finally the outcome of the disease. And this uh, brings us to the last uh, part of my presentation, which is uh, focused on the coagulopathy. And in this particular study published in Journal of Thrombosis and Hemostasis, again recently, uh, what was found is that abnormal coagulation results uh, are associated with poor prognosis. And therefore, we are not talking about the platelet counts or neutrophils or other cells, you know, lymphocytes. We are talking about the coagulation parameters, uh, which I try to show, show you in the figure, the first figure that I uh, spent some time on. And uh, we'll see examples of this. And this throws a lot of uh, light on the underlying pathophysiology and pathogenesis of the coagulation abnormalities uh, that uh, happen in these patients. And um, here, this study mentions that existence of disseminated intervascular coagulation is common in patients of NCPs, basically novel coronavirus virus, uh, pneumonia, uh, who uh, die. So this is, uh, again, a very profound, profound statement, an important statement, which uh, uh, we'll see a little in a greater detail in the subsequent slides. So this uh, paper has been um, widely quoted by many uh, review articles. And therefore, I have uh, brought it uh, to share it with you. And here, as you can see on the first, uh, in the first column, you can see the various uh, uh, coagulation parameters or laboratory tests like prothrombin time, APTT, fibrinogen, D-dimer, FDP, and antithrombin. Now, PT and APTT, as we all know, are screening coagulation assays. PT reflects the intactness of the extrinsic pathway and is influenced very largely by the factor seven while APTT is a representative of the intrinsic pathway and is influenced by multiple factors. Fibrinogen, of course, as you know, 
is the precursor of fibrin, fibrin formation or fibrin. D-dimer is the product of uh, cleavage of uh, cross-linked fibrin, uh, which indicates thrombotic process. Uh, FDP, as I mentioned, is an indicator of the uh, fibrinolytic pathway, which happens uh, or is produced as a result of digestion of fibrin, part particularly, uh, uh, or fibrinogen by the uh, fib uh, uh, no, fibrinolytic uh, enzymes. And antithrombin is a naturally occurring uh, anticoagulant, if you call, or inhibitor, which inactivates activated clotting factors, particularly the thrombin. So it is expected that these parameters would change in patients of uh, COVID-19 uh, infection who have uh, uh, badly or grossly deranged uh, coagulation system or have major coagulopathy as the disease progresses. But when you look at the data, uh, of course, uh, the uh, data here are statistically significant as evident from the p-value. Uh, but when you look at the uh, individual uh, values or the, the, you know, the range that uh, one sees in patients who have survived versus those who did not survive, uh, the difference doesn't seem that grossly you know, abnormal. And the same is true for APTT. Uh, and this is an observation which is, is very different from sepsis-induced DIC or other types of DIC that we come across in common practice, wherein because of the consumption of coagulation factors in the thrombotic process uh, or disseminated intervascular coagulation, these factors which are responsible for intactness of the, uh, the two pathways that I just now mentioned, extrinsic and intrinsic pathway, uh, get consumed in the process of thrombus formation. And that results in a uh, decreased level of these proteins. And that in, in turn affects these screening assays. So it is very common to see grossly abnormal PT and APTT in patients of DIC, classic DIC, uh, but not so much in the patients of COVID-19 in, uh, in induced thrombophilia. And this is something which is important. And the reason for that possibly is that in COVID-19 infection, the uh, process is predominantly thrombotic and not uh, associated with that uh, degree of uh, fibrinolysis. And therefore, the markers of thrombosis as, for example, FDP, uh, I'm sorry, D-dimer, are elevated more uh, prominently or more, um, uh, you know, obviously than those of fibrinolysis. Uh, although, as shown here, the FDP is uh, also significantly increased in the non-survivors, but this may have been done uh, terminally when actually the uh, process of fibrinolysis can take over. Uh, so this is a point which I wanted to drive across, and that is that the process of uh, coagulopathy in patients of COVID-19 infection uh, is tilted towards the uh, thrombotic uh, pathology or thrombotic pathogenesis than fibrinolytic uh, in, uh, component. The subsequent slides show again, uh, of course, uh, these individual parameters in patients of COVID-19 infection. This is prothrombin time. Uh, and as the patients who uh, survive their uh, PT does not change very much, uh, while non-survivors show uh, gradual increase in the prothrombin time. But um, prothrombin time in increment that we see, as I mentioned, in these patients is not of that magnitude as you see in the patients of uh, sepsis-induced DIC. Um, Fibrinogen also, as expected, uh, being a, a factor which is in, uh, required for production of fibrin, gets consumed in the thrombotic uh, uh, process that these patients have. And uh, therefore, the as you can see, in the non-survivors, the fibrinogen levels tended to go down, while in the survivors, uh, shown in a blue uh, you know, line, the fibrinogen level remained reasonably constant throughout the duration of illness. And uh, D-dimer, as I was mentioning, uh, shows a uh, gradual increase in the level uh, in the uh, non-survivors compared to the survivors. And this, again, as I mentioned, is 
a product of a thrombotic pathology or thrombo hypercoagulable state in these patients. D-dimer also has been looked at from the point of view of its level. As I mentioned earlier, that D-dimer is not only correlated uh, or doesn't only correlate with the uh, mortality, high levels do not only correlate with the mortality, but also the level per se uh, correlates uh, with increasing mortality if the uh, D-dimer level increases. Uh, two, up to two or beyond two microgram per ml. Uh, ml. So this uh, diagram shows this uh, uh, phenomenon very clearly that in uh, patients who survive or patients who have a higher survival probability, they have a constant level of D-dimer which is less than two microgram per ml versus those who have lower survival probability uh, where the D-dimer is more than uh, two microgram per ml and therefore this parameter if it is used on a serial uh, uh, manner uh, to determine or monitor these patients then they, they can predict uh, the you know impending um, seriousness or criticality of the case and warn physicians with respect to the uh, you know potential danger and therefore maybe um, modification of therapy in these cases uh, towards more uh, aggressive therapy. And this is what is mentioned here. So I don't want to uh, repeat this, but it has been shown that uh, patients uh, who do not survive have D-dimer values which are beyond fourfold. And uh, this is very, very important uh, pointer uh, to the grave prognosis in these patients. So in summary, uh, in COVID-19, the coagulopathy uh, is associated with signs of coagulation activation mimicking DIC, but that DIC is not same as the usual uh, DIC that we come across in the sense that uh, there is less prominent thrombocytopenia, which I have been emphasizing on, and less consumption of coagulation proteins. And these two are, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, reflected by uh, not so low uh, platelet count in the patients of COVID-19 infection versus uh, DIC caused by sepsis, and not so much of abnormality of the APTT and PT in uh, COVID-19 patients compared to DIC. So this is an important point which uh, all of us should keep in mind, and therefore, uh, uh, not uh, really look for severe thrombocytopenia or abnormality of uh, screening coagulation assays to call these patients as uh, sick patients because these are unlikely to change very much or show very much abnormality. So we'll have to depend on other parameters like D-dimer. And uh, since this is a predominantly a pro-thrombotic condition uh, and we are aware of such other conditions such as uh, thrombotic thrombocytopenic uh, purpura, wherein uh, the patients have a predominant thrombotic condition, uh, not so much associated with fibrinolysis, wherein there, is, there are abnormalities of uh, breakdown of the von Willebrand factor multimers, and uh, that causes increased uh, co coagulability or hypercoagulable state. So one uh, would like to see what happens to these multimers in patients of COVID-19 coagulopathy or infection and um, it, uh, there is already there are in fact studies underway on uh, uh, to look at this aspect of uh, uh, coagulation abnormality and um, uh, hopefully very interesting data would emerge from there and again prominent increase in D-dimer with predictive value of adverse outcome is uh, the hallmark of COVID-19 coagulopathy. So finally, before I stop the uh, take home message uh, that we need to uh, look at or consider are that the monocytes and macro and or macrophages uh, get activated and they are the central to the pathogenesis, morbidity and mortality in COVID-19 infection. The disease is very good model for close linkage showing or proving the close linkage between 
inflammatory pathways and activation of the coagulation pathway. The hypercoagulable state in COVID-19 is different from the classic DIC that we come across uh, as shown by moderate thrombocytopenia only, near normal PT, normal APTT and high D dimer level. And the degree of macrophage activation and the severity of the associated changes in the body determine the clinical outcome of this disease. And lastly, these changes are reflected as abnormalities of several laboratory parameters. And these parameters serve as important prognostic markers since they are associated with uh, poor survival. So before I uh, stop, I just would like to thank uh, my colleagues, Dr. Uh, Vineet, uh, for his um, efforts, both in preparation of my presentation as well as coordinating this session. Uh, Mr. Sumit Roy uh, for organizing this uh, webinar and uh, 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 my other colleagues, clinical colleagues or medical colleagues, Dr. Anupa, uh, who has contributed to uh, this presentation by her suggestions and uh, um, uh, our managing director, Mr. Uh, Sanjay Arora, who has been the inspiration for uh, the series of uh, seminars or uh, rather uh, webinars that we are going to organize uh, for all of you in the next few weeks. And finally, uh, uh, Hotiba for their support in organizing this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for that informative presentation. Uh, we will now move on to the Q&A section. Uh, we will try to uh, answer as many questions as possible within the time limit that we have. Please note all your questions will be answered either now or via email. So please stay on for the Q&A session. In the meanwhile, we've also published a poll. Please rate the webinar in terms of content and presentation with uh, 1 to 10. Please give 10 if you feel it's been excellent. So uh, we've received a lot of questions. Uh, so I will be compiling a few of those together because more many of them yeah. are closely related. The question that's been asked by far is the role of any kind of anticoagulant therapy or prophylactic anticoagulant therapy given this hypercoagulable state. Many patients, many doctors have asked about uh, whether there should be any anticoagulants given, whether aspirin should be given. So what's your take on that? Well, um, I think uh, we are still learning and uh, from the data that are available as of now, uh, COVID-19, uh, where you show that there is an underlying coagulopathy in the patient, as evident from the uh, various parameters that uh, I shared with you that you need to monitor, there is a fit case for uh, prophylactic uh, anticoagulation, whether with uh, low molecular weight heparins or with uh, now the newer anticoagulants called NOAX or DOAX. Uh, so there is, um, uh, in fact, in practice, uh, you, uh, people are using this um, approach. And um, uh, about the antiplatelets, I'm not sure. Did you ask aspirin antiplatelets? Yes, there have been a couple of questions about that. Sir. Yeah, so antiplatelets, I'm not very sure about. Because, uh, you know, A, that the patients of COVID-19 as I shared, uh, told you, uh, do not have very severe thrombocytopenia. Uh, if they uh, and uh, uh, they and a patient who has already thrombocytopenia, uh, the role of uh, antiplatelet antibodies uh, or other uh, drugs would be only limited. So I'm not very sure if antiplatelet drugs would be of much use in this kind of a condition. If at all, they may cause problem by uh, you know. Uh, paralyzing the platelets, thereby increasing the risk of bleeding in these patients. Thank you, sir. Uh, another question that's been asked is when should D-dimer be measured? Um, well, uh, I think uh, for any kind of monitoring of any parameter in medical practice, we need to have a baseline value. And then subsequently, uh, you know, as the disease progresses, you uh, do uh, repeat these um, you know, tests uh, at different time points. So that also applies to D-dimer assay. And I would say that if the uh, patient on uh, clinical merits uh, is a fit case for uh, admission, then at the time of admission uh, would be the right time to uh, do a platelet count because before that the patient has possibly not uh, been seen or uh, 
properly examined. So that's the time when you should do the platelet count, first platelet count to get the baseline value and then follow uh, depending on the uh, level. So if uh, uh, you know the count is reduced but not very low, uh, one can do uh, twice a week or even weekly uh, you know, uh, level. Uh, so uh, uh, we are talking about D dimer. So in that case, if uh, the uh, value is uh, not uh, very high, so there you can do these assays less frequently. But uh, if it is showing an upward trend, you need to do it at least daily, uh, because based on that you will be uh, determining whether the person is progressing uh, towards a uh, you know, more severe condition or not. But there are no hard and fast rules. Uh, this has to be on clinical judgment. Yes, sir. So one, I think we have time for one last question. Uh, another question that has been asked is uh, one of the points that has been put forward is that a lot of younger patients are presenting with strokes and uh, other thromboembolic events. So many people are asking, is that uh, is the thromboembolic part of COVID-19 more dangerous than the pneumonia part? Um, pneumonia, I think uh, it's uh, a double whammy, in fact. Uh, pneumonia is the way these patients would uh, I mean, commonly present. Uh, it may be uh, not severe, but there may be, uh, you know, mild lesion or mild affection of the, um, you know, the lungs. Uh, and, uh, but independently they have, as I shared with you, an increased risk of uh, thrombosis. And therefore, uh, you know, if you uh, got a patient who uh, gets uh, this uh, as an additional complication, uh, that's a bad scenario. But whether, uh, you know, uh, you would need to treat one preferentially over the other, I'm not very sure. You have to treat both because both have their own, uh, you know, implications. So a patient who uh, has pneumonia and gets, a, uh, you know, pulmonary embolism on top of that, would be, uh, you know, very severely sick person. So he will have to be managed for both. So I would uh, say that this is what would be the logical way of approaching these patients. OK, sir, just one more question, because we keep getting questions on this. Uh, can any of these parameters in predict COVID-19 infection in a patient who presents with an influenza-like illness? Any of these uh, parameters, can they use to predict a patient who comes with influenza? Can we predict uh, that they have COVID-19? Yeah, so uh, as we know that um, the coagulopathy or thrombophilic state or you know, hypercoagulopathy state is unique to COVID-19 of the various viral infections. Uh, but viral infections are very common and it is not uncommon to see uh, you know, like um, lymphopenia or thrombocytosis, uh, thrombocytopenia in these patients. So. Uh, According to me, there is nothing which is very, uh, you know, uh, definitive in terms of uh, distinguishing uh, patients of COVID-19 from other uh, influenza-like, uh, you know, situations or other viral infections which have similar presentation. Uh, so I think the uh, the reason or uh, the point to look at would be the high rate of suspicion uh, based on the other symptoms. Uh, of which there is a list now available which we need to look for in these patients and uh, do, straight away go ahead and do a because these are symptomatic patients do a rt-pcr for covid-19 infections and solve the matter rather than you know try to look for markers which are not necessarily definitive in either condition thank you sir thank you again for sharing your knowledge and expertise uh, before we go, I'd like to thank all the attendees for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Uh, please feel assured that we will answer all of your questions by email. We will also be emailing you a link to the recording of this webinar within 24 to 48 hours. You will be able to watch the recording at your convenience. Please feel free to forward the link of the recording to your colleagues who may have missed this webinar. Uh, thank you once again, Dr. Das Gupta, and I also like to thank Suburban mm -hmm. Diagnostics and Horeba for the uh, for this presentation. We will also be emailing you and informing all the attendees about any further webinars. So I'd uh, thank you again. Have a nice day. Everybody, please stay safe.